If you're new in town or just new to this actual play thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night Productions. Together, alongside a culturally diverse and queer cast, Law by Night Productions aims to bring fun actual plays varying mood, tone, and wholesome chillaxed fun with none of the pretentious professional bollocks. In this Pride Month special episode, you're listening to Pride Podcast by Night, a queer as fuck vampire the masquerade one shot using 5th edition rules. The full cast will be revealed at the end of the episode. This actual play contains themes of dark personal horror, excessively bad language, and violence throughout. Listener discretion is advised. And with that out of the way, are we sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. The world in which I would like to invite you all tonight is a world much like our own, but darker. A world of darkness, if you would. When it rains, the downpours are more intense, the shadows creep longer. It is more violent and morbid, and that's just talking about the humans. A whole slew of supernatural entities do more than go boo in the night, but... I have a sneaking suspicion you all know about that. But with all this in mind, it is not all doom and gloom. For every crevice engulfed in darkness, the most potent of light breaks through. For all those under the oppressive thumb of despair, just as many are embraced in the safe, warm cocoon of hope. And, more importantly, to our tale tonight, the rebellious cries of minorities of all descriptions are louder and prouder. Those under the banner of the LGTBQIA plus community are more harmonious. The transgenders are braver, the bisexuals are more indecisive, and the gays overall are just that extra bit fabulous plus. Especially if you are a child of Cain, a vampire. Come now, you really believe they haven't tried it just once? Vampires and queer go hand in hand, which is something our four kindred know very, very well. And if any of this bothers you, you're not welcome to partake in this and all tales I tell. This quartet of vampires reside in the city of Hemingworth, a large, definitely not fictional city that sits on the northeastern Hampshire Surrey border in the United Kingdom. Hemingworth... Hemingworth is filled with a busy and thriving populace, fueled on hot coffee, cheap food and the arts. A rich history is deeply embedded within the city's culture, dating back to as far as the 11th century. Most of it is harmless and safe, but Hemingworth is no stranger to controversy. But I digress. That is a story for another time. Our kindred, like most of in the city, are members of the Camarilla. Hemingworth has always been a Camarilla domain for the sect's existence, and is currently under the rule of a Prince Alexandria of Clan Le Sombre, which has always been an unusual ruling, especially when it is no secret that she and some of her council were Sabat turncoats during an invasion in the late 1800s. Whether our four have an opinion on that or may not may be relevant to tonight's tale, but let us abandon the history lesson and focus on our queer creatures of the night. You have been up for a couple of hours, the night is young, and the air is calm, with a gentle, mild breeze rubbing your shoulder if you were to go walk about in the forever busy streets of Hemingworth. Now, could our four kindred please roll me 1d4? That is a three for me. It's a one for me. That's a twinsy on the threesies. And I have a four. Well... If you would like to write that number in your hunger tracker, that is currently how hungry you are. (laughs) That's not good. Oh, no. (laughs) No, it's not good at all. Well, some of you, it's quite all right. You were sensible with your activities the night before. But for one individual, um, hmm, not so much. It would be a fantastic place to start with you. You awake. Your body reanimates to, you feel the blood just shift and twist, and it's furious, I dare say. The creature, the beast within you is wanting to break loose. It is starving. We are hungry. The smell, Vita, we must hunt. We must feed. Why are we still here? What are your intentions? Well, um... 
I be- I believe our my dear Hendrix needs to get a animal as soon as possible. Maybe a couple if he can handle it. Mm, always with the lesser creatures. You continue to obey the laws of the lessers. We will perish. Silence you. <sighs> You know why we can't do that. The prophetic laws of the lessers. And just you just hear it continue to growl and snarl and bicker away, just wanting to break free, he says, without wanting to burst into song. So, <laughs> how is it do you wish to attract or hunt for said animals? Actually, before we do that, actually, where are you currently? Um, usually... Uh, our dear, dear uh, dragon <laughs> slumbers underneath Elysium, as that is where he works most often. That is where the victims are brought to him the most, and that is where he makes his profession. So that is usually where he sleeps, as well as where he keeps his quote unquote art pieces. So it is by far the most comfortable place for him to sleep. An Elysium for you, or at least the default Elysium setting, is the College of Arts, Music, and Performing Arts. It's um, There's always been rumours and speculation that some ancient, well, old catacombs run beneath that old established building, but of course no mortal has been able to find it, or at least very few have been able to find it and live to tell the tale. It's a fairly modern, lit-up place, uh, wanting to stay with the times, which is a very interesting point considering the prints. So, would you have animals in your haven, or would you have to leave the vicinity and go and hunt? Um, there are probably one or two um, to keep me from getting ravenous. Um, however, they never, uh, at least the sheriff doesn't like me to have too many as to keep me on a sort of leash. That she does. She likes toying with her little pet. Uh, the sheriff, as you know, is a uh, Ventru. Um, her name is Olivia. Very odd choice for many, um, but she enjoys her work. Great pleasure in keeping what she seems to be as the riffraff in charge. So what sort of animals would you be allowed to keep, presuming in cages? Uh, usually rats. Mm. Uh, anything that Hendrix can catch when he is out, but anything that uh, the sheriff brings to him is usually a rat or rodent of some kind, very... Uh, very rarely do you get does does Hendrix get anything above that type of animal. Mm. So, if you wish to feed on these two or three rats, I would allow you to do that. How would you go about doing that? Uh, just snatching, just snatching one right out of the cage and putting my things right into it and mm. sucking as quickly as possible. And throughout the years, as Hendrix is a little bit on the older side, he's gotten quite used to just taking it like a shot, basically. Just in, suck it all in as one big gulp and throwing it away. Yes, yeah, so I imagine that it's come to quite a, Almost a routine between any and other rats that you would meet that they don't really have enough time to react. That you just open the cage door in, snatch, and mm-hmm. kind of hold almost like a Capri Sun, dare I say. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Hendrix also has a cat, a Peterbald Familius, who does a system in catching rodents every now and then. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so, with the two wraps there uh, that would take you down to a more comfortable to hunger uh the your beast isn't so much roaring and snarling you and mocking you as you're devouring it but it's it's first is quenched somewhat you just feel little rumbles 
every so often. And as you're like getting yourself well, you know, regaining your composure once more, you hear the loud footsteps of somebody coming along. Look at the click of the door and it swings open and standing in a very fine, tight fitting black dress as a woman uh, with bright orange hair, just sort of done up in a sort of bun. Uh, you recognize this to be Olivia. And she's sort of staring at you with a puzzled face. She sees the little that remains of the rat on the floor. And she looks at you and she just smirks. She doesn't say anything at this time. Mm-hmm. Well, how lovely to see you, my lady. I'd say it's a pleasure to see you too, but we both know it would be lying. But I appreciate your efforts at common etiquette parlance. Ah. Feeling better? Mm. I am... I am well enough. Good. Then I have a little job for you. And she begins to leave the room. And he follows. You follow, and again, the same sort of similar modern lighting and design is following around you. Um, There's some paintings of some... I don't know, figures on the wall. Uh, you walk past the mother kindred, you recognise the scourge, uh, an individual who you only know by the name of Liquid Spider, a Asian woman with a bob, very loose, flashy clothes, and her arms are just covered in a very strange reddish tattoos. She doesn't say anything. She glares at the sheriff. The sheriff glares back, continues to walk on past. Oh, don't mind her. A particular target of her is very good at hiding, and she announced that quite loudly. So, Liquid Spider hears, but doesn't say or do anything. Olivia leads you to a door and lock, unlocks it. And in this room, it's, it looks like an office. You know, it's your, your standard um, table, bookshelf and whatnot. But there's no windows. You're still somewhat underground. One side, there's a chair. It's empty. It looks like a big old luxurious um, armchair. And in the other armchair, there is an individual that is tied and has like a bit of rope tied around their mouth. This individual here has caused me a little bit of trouble. Seems to be from some anarch coterie feeding in territory that she know that she shouldn't be in. I would like you to extract that piece of information from her. I know that she is hiding something why she was there, because I don't believe she was just feeding there. Don't make too much of an effort to expend your vitae. You've already a bit tetchy, she smirks. But I would like some answers, and be quick. And she just stands in the doorway. I will get right on that. Good boy. He walks over to the Anarch that is tied up. And he just takes his fingers, his forefinger and his thumb, and just twirls her hair and just lightly touches it. Getting a feel for her. We are about to have some fun together, my dear. She's sort of making soft, confused, and wide whimpering noises. And the, the hair, unfortunately, isn't particularly soft, or it could do with a bit of a wash. It's a bit dry, unfortunately. But um, that's anox for you. I can work with it. And then I drag her off to the dragon's lair under Elysium, and I'm going to get to work. And of course, I'm going to rouse to start flesh crafting. <laughs> hmm. That is a success on the rouse. Yes, you do not get hungry. You are the dragon. You are the one taming the beast within. The beast will not tame you. Mm-hmm. So, what is it exactly that you will be doing here? Oh, well, first we're going... We'll start off slow, just... Showing, showing her exactly what she's going to be in for. With flesh crafting, he makes sure to 
reinvigor reinvigorate every little dead nerve as they as he presses into them. So what is he uh, pushing into her or into himself or into her? Right. Uh, Perhaps going until he can feel the first sign of bone, and just it's just a light little. Starting off slow, just a light little touch going into her skin, making sure all the nerves are firing off as it goes and touches the bone. Uh, those whimpers very quickly become loud, muffled screams, assuming that you hadn't removed the bit of rope that's uh, in her mouth. Uh, it's very clear that what you're doing is causing some significant amount of damage, but she's still not talking yet. Mm. Well, of course we have to... We have to warm them up a little bit, don't we? And I'm going, uh, Hendrix is going to playfully take the rope that's, a, that's around her mouth and place his uh, opposite hand on her wrist. And in one quick motion, he's going to take off the uh, rope and he's going to push up on her wrist and just take off the skin. Oh, nasty. There is a particularly unique ripping noise that would be heard across to anybody that would be there, which wouldn't be the other free coterie here. But anybody who would be passing through would hear not only this horrible noise, um, but the scream that follows. Um, part terror, uh, again, part confusion, but there's a lot of fear there. And this uh, woman just starts screaming, Oh! All right, I'll talk. Ah, Jesus Christ! Oh, so soon. I was hoping to get a little bit more time with you. But please, dear. And he takes her chin and puts it directly into his eyesight. Let me hear what you have to say. Or you cannot talk and we could have some more fun. No. It's your choice. No, I'll, I'll talk. Just... just. I was waiting for Gary. He said he'd show up. He's been gone for days. Gary? Who is this Gary? I don't know the name. He's just, he's just a member of our pack. He's just, just... That's just all. And I was hungry. I didn't mean no wrong. And as this moment of silence, as she's sort of like panting and hyperventing and screaming, you just hear a very slow clap from behind you uh, coming from Olivia. Bravo, Hendrix. Hmm. You have been paying attention. Hmm. I have dare say I'm almost impressed. Oh, just almost. If you wanted more of a show, I can give it to you. She opens her mouth to respond to that with a bit of a twisted smile. Your phone rings. Olivia looks the direction towards the sound, she goes, Oh, well, you may answer it. If you allow it. And then he answers it. Uh, the individual that you speak um, isn't a voice that you immediately recognize. Um, it's, a, it's a male voice, for sure. Truth is elusive. It's nowhere to be found. Never written down. Come to Shadow World. An opportunity presents itself. And it hands up. Hmm. How odd. A problem, Hendrix, Olivia says. Strange phone call. Beckoning me to something called Shadow World. Have you heard of it? Olivia looks up for a second. Hmm. The jazz club owned by Marilyn de Rouge. Curious. Well, I suggest you go and speak with her. I'll carry on from here. Have fun. I'll be on my way. I will do my absolute best. She will smirks, smiling her pet. And she'll leave. You know where to go. You've been shown enough times. There is a lift that sort of takes you up to sort of where the main reception is of the university. Its students would go up and down there all the time. Well, they'd mainly go up. Any student that's caught going down doesn't tend to come back up again. We'll move away from that scene for now. And um, let's move on to somebody that has a much a closer association to our Azumitsi. 
a diva, a clan of the rose. What would you be doing on this relatively pleasant summer's night? Well, now that the night has started, Mira is probably primping, getting nice and pretty for the night. And what does that involve for you? Uh, mostly hair, makeup, clothing. Um, if I can give Mira a look, it would be uh, a yassified uh, marble statue. Yes. Just almost well. completely white. It makes... <laughs> yes. Um, paper has more pigment than this particular kindred. They are almost a ghastly white, almost like studio effect. There's no way that a normal person could be such a color, but that they are. Um, otherwise, piercing dark eyes, and they are dressed in like um, red and black and being overall fabulous. Oh, and fabulous that you are. And you're just sort of making they're just really, I say, going to town because, I mean, what is a toy or that isn't somewhat of an arrogant perfectionist. So. You two do this for time, spending quite oh, a significant amount of time. And when when you feel that you're satisfied with it, what would be the next port of call? What what's a typical night look like for you? Um, typically, uh, they would be down uh, in the dragon slayer, quote unquote. But seeing that there's um, possibly work to be done, they're at their haven. And what does your haven look like? I imagine. Well, is that just as yassified, or is that? bit more refined shall we say um yeah it's definitely uh more modern uh very sleek um of course covered uh to avoid any sunlight and perhaps it's a gallery of its own it's covered in art and statues and sculptures uh to marvel when there isn't much to do that's absolutely fair i mean doesn't always have to do anything. Sometimes it's nice just to relax as a kindred because such opportunities are very rare and hard to find. Always being pushed about, shoved about to do. And unfortunately, you receive a, you receive a text message. It's an unknown number. Unfortunately. Um, yes, it's a pity that. Um, text message reads, Truth is elusive. It's nowhere to be found. Never written down. Come to Shadow World. An opportunity presents itself. M. I don't remember signing up for poetry. And they read the message just up and down a couple times. Um, would they know um, Shadow World? Hmm. Are they, well, depends. Would you, are they into music that much? I would suppose so. Well, I will allow a, let's see, a Wits and Streetwise roll. Ooh, two successes. Two successes. You have heard of this. It's um jazz club and there's, there's so there's probably some sort of poetry involved. You've heard like some sort of free spoken thing, sets of music. But you you are vaguely aware that it is owned by some kindred, so it does seem vaguely important. <sighs> they sigh, put their phone away, and reach for a coat and follow this rabbit trail. And how would you get there? Will you walk, take a car, or have somebody drive you? As I imagine, you are the sort of kindred that would be escorted about. Yeah, they'll be driven. Of course. And we shall depart. This once uneventful scene. This hmm, clean scene, I guess, and move into territories more dirty, grimy, perhaps. At the very least, hidden away. If we move... I'd think to two kindred. And what would be typical nights for one clan of the deaf and one of the ones of the wild? Where Lee's hunger is and how long he has been a kindred, um, I imagine he is in Liliana's haven, kind of balled up on the floor, just trying to suppress that urge of the beast. Uh, remind me again what your hunger was. Three. Three. So you hear it snarl and you almost feel like your rib cage as a literal cage holding back this ferocious animal that's just snarling and growling and snapping. That's just, it's not quite screaming at you. It's not desperate, but you know, you are 
noticeably hungry. I imagine Lee will attempt to stagger to his feet and go to the mini fridge that they have wired up in there in the mausoleum. Um, there are several blood bags. Hmm. That is a good question about how many blood bags this would be in. Um, to the owner of such a place, how many would you typically... S if the fridge was filled to its maximum capacity, how many blood bags would be in there usually? I'm trying to remember how large a mini fridge is. Like four cans of soda. <laughs> yeah, so probably... probably um, gosh, I'm trying to remember how big an actual blood bag is. Probably six would fit in. A uh, reasonable sized mini fridge. Hmm. I see. That's a nice number. It'll be such a shame if you can buy dice of that many sides. Mm. Mm. It'd be a shame you if you if you rolled a dice of that many sides to see what was in there. Uh, I It'd have. It'd be a shame if there were only one blood bag in the fridge. <laughs> Ooh. That would be tragic. Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. I imagine in Lee's head there is a no, that's rent for this month. Um <laughs> shuts the fridge. <laughs> stalks into like the main part of the mausoleum. <clears throat> hey Liliana, I need to go out. Why are you slamming the door of my fridge? No reason in particular, just we're out of blood bags, and I know how much you just love those Capri Suns, blood orange flavored. You're gonna have to explain to me at some point what a Capri Sun is. It's just if a you're referring to your rent. Yes, I do love that. Can we negotiate rent at some point instead of like a whole blood bag? Maybe like I don't know something a bit more reasonable. Go find another haven. I think that's pl plenty reasonable. Uh, closes his eyes. I'm going to go hit the clinic. How hungry are you? Comparatively, I could eat a horse. Liliana will huff, uh, go to the fridge and stick a silly straw in the blood bag and hand it to Lee. Does the silly straw read bad bitch? No, it reads dumbass. <laughs> ah, it's okay. Lee's silly straw. <laughs> yes. it's, a, it's a synonym, so it might as well have said that. <laughs> uh, drink this, and then I'll go with you. Last time, you almost brought the police down on us. Gingerly, he will take the blood bag and begin to sip, thinking about how he got here. Mm. It's, um, you've had better... Vite, you certainly had a lot worse given the previous company that you kept. Um, but it will do. It it satiates the need of the Vite just to rip your cage open and just eat something for our more fulfilling. And uh, you may slake Juan Hunger, taking you down to two. And before we move on to heading up the clinic, what did the uh, Liliana and our other kindred look like? Uh, Liliana is all of five feet tall, a uh, slim build with pale skin and freckles across her nose. She has long, dark black hair that's wavy and unruly. Half of it's pulled up into a bun on the top of her head, and the ends are dyed red as though at one point she had dyed her hair but forgotten to go back for touch-ups. Uh, Lee is... Comparatively, a lot taller than Liliana, standing at a 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, um, dressed in all-black athleisure. Um, Asian, kind of pale skin, like he's been inside for way too long. His hair's been cut short into a faux hawk, and sometimes he just wears a cap over it. Uh, right now, indoors, no cap. How polite. Does that does that include me? Because I did not describe Hendrix. <laughs> ah, that was something I overlooked. Okay, well, as we're here, what does Hendrix look like? Okay, uh, I probably should have brought it up earlier. Uh, Hendrix is a six foot two sort of 
um, I don't want to say alien because he's not quite flesh crafted enough to be alien yet, but he is a stunning work of art. He uh, has crafted his self to be very, very pale, very much like Mira, though not as uh, iridescent. (laughs) Uh, His hair is white to match and long and and falls just past his shoulders. And he has noticeably sharper teeth than a human, though nothing that's going to draw any questions. And uh, to those who are observant, he has a tinge of purple to his Mm. eyes. Very interesting looking individual indeed. So, returning back to the mausoleum, uh, the idea that you two are going to hit up a clinic. Are you sure you can keep up with me? Like, I prefer to move fast and alone and, you know, Funny, that's everything that I said when I, you told me you wanted to live here. Shall we go? Lee will open the door for Liliana. She didn't say no, so there is a moment outside where Lee closes his eyes, focuses, and I'm going to use my protean discipline to activate weight of the feather. Um, essentially, he becomes weightless for an indefinite amount of time. And what is the purpose with this here? As you're leaving. Um, essentially, it he's using it to increase his uh, running speed and ability to jump. So there is essentially going to be a parkouring kindred on the roof. Hmm. I'm not quite too sure if that fits the ruling, but I quite like how cool that is, so I shall allow that. Um, what's Liliana's mode of travel because I'm not entirely sure that she could keep up with him. I could be wrong. She'll just get behind the wheel of a 1952 Buick. Maybe she can. Actually, because I think this would be quite a funny idea, if we could have like a a, uh, a contest of sorts to see who will get to the clinic first. Uh, so if Liniana could do a dex and drive and Lee could do dex and athletics. Oh, I don't have drive. Would that just be dex? Yes. Yes, okay, it's my dex. I'm sure, this is going to go so well for me. <laughs> oh, okay. I've got a pair of tens. Ooh, are any of them on the? I, hun- I had one success. One success. So, just out of curiosity, any of those tens on the hunger dice, or they're just the regular? Uh, regular. Uh, and then this was my hunger dice. Hunger dice is a six. That would be a success. So the two tens is five. Sorry, four. And then. You are one with the wind, bullseye. Um, just uh, Lee, just leaping, uh, sliding, glide, or practically gliding through the environment. Uh, Liliana, you get stuck in traffic. Of course. It's off to a great start, but that's all that you're getting. It's just traffic all the way there. Could there have been a moment where Liliana just feels a small, like, boof, as Lee uses the Buick to cross the street? Um, sure, I will allow that, just to add insult to injury. The salt with the cold from earlier on, I think it's a beautiful pairing. Uh, so eventually, uh, Liniana arrives, um, and Lee's been waiting for some time. You should really not use Main Street, you could have gone up to 3rd and then made a left on Bishop. Avoid traffic altogether, honestly. I drive a literal boat compared to modern cars. There are, like, sportier options in modern car. Uh, Lee is going for a fanny pack and is pulling out a set of lockpicks. Mm. I like my car. I've had it since it was new. Like in the 60s? <sighs> Have you been keeping up with insurance? And, like, what happens when someone pulls you over? Do they check your driver's license? I, these are questions I should have probably asked, like, months ago, honestly. You still have so much to learn. So, I was going to ask what's the plan here, but it seems like whipping up the lot picks, you have already established a plan. Backdoor. Of course. Uh, Liniana, are you following? Are you going to try something else? Are you just waiting for Lee to do his fang? She's going to stand there and critique his lockpicking, as she is also proficient in lockpicking. Okay. 
So if Lee could perform a dex and larceny, please. Um, and, and if you have a, any specialties in that, you may add one die. Okay. Nine dice. Hmm. I expect many great things. Maybe not. There's there's a double one in there. Um, I got a success. No tens. But you got one. You managed to get a success. Yes. Now, if you think it's really important, you can spend some willpower to roll up to three normal die. If you really oh. want to. I think it'd be funnier if uh, I just suffer the consequences of any. Let's go for that. Well, as there was a success, it, you go through a couple of lockpicks. Um, it's not a very... You're there for some time, and Leanna, you're just watching him, just judging just how... It, it's a really simple lock. He shouldn't be taking this long. Like, it'd be easier at this point to kick the door in, but yeah, he's eventually getting through lockpicks. He does manage to... A little, the door opens. Go on. I know you have a com like a comment. You need to turn it to the left three times before hitting the bumper on the right. That's not how locks work. There are tumblers inside of the locks. Yes, you need the to tumblers. apply pressure. Mm -hmm. You went the wrong direction. Politely holds the door open for Liliana. Thank you. So you both enter this small clinic. It's, oddly enough, there are lights on. And the strange sense of death lingers in the air. It's something that Liana, I'd imagine, would be more accustomed to than Lee. But if you would have a poke around, you would find... Um, I shall just roll a d10 to determine that. What does that say? Um, in some sort of freezer container thing, seven blood bags. Are any of them, what is it, O and AB negative are the ones that Lee avoids because it's universal donor for O and AB is so fucking rare that he just doesn't take it. Hmm. Uh, I think this would be a wonderful time to employ another home ruling of mine. Uh, the first one was the D4. We're going to play a game of odds and evens. Um, in my hand, I currently hold a black D10. Basically, you're going to call for odds and evens. Uh, if the number matches your response, then fate will fall in your favor. Otherwise, no. So, odds and evens. Uh, I'll call evens. Uh, there are the blood types that you are looking for when you scan the labels. Oh, good. You didn't bring a shopping bag with you, did you? She's carrying a large purse. It's tote bag size, practically. Boop, 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 boop. So I'm assuming that you're taking all the blood bags. Leah will leave two. Um, the, the blood bags will be for both of them collectively. Gotcha. Okay. So, you exit. And almost at the same time, well, I'm assuming that Leanna would have some sort of mobile phone. Uh you receive text messages which read you, you'll never guess what it is truth is elusive it's nowhere to be found never written down come to shadow world an opportunity presents itself M you've been at this vampire game a lot longer than I have what exactly is shadow world? do I know what shadow world is? does Leanna go to any jazz clubs at all is that the sort of thing that she'd be into? She doesn't like going out at all. <laughs> and probably not, no. Okay. I don't know. Is it one of those new TikTok things that you keep telling me about? Maybe one of those instant grams? No, it's more like um, a book of faces. I knew someone who kept a book of faces once. The noses didn't make it close properly. Lee's gonna go on the web and look up Shadow World. Um... Very quickly, you find you you type in you don't find anything immediately other to some, the title of some obscure video game. But then you type in the city name, and you find that it's actually not that far from you. It's a it's a jazz club. You into uh you into jazz, Liliana? Mm. Sometimes. I'm a Nat King Cole fan myself. 
So what what is this? It's like a mass text blast. Is it spam? I don't know. Mine doesn't make sense. And she'll hold up her Nokia to him. It's all out of order. There is a visible recoil looking at your brick Nokia phone. We should upgrade your phone at some point. It works just fine. But how will you see the TikToks and the instant grams? I'm still not convinced that I want to see any of those things based on what you've shown me. Although I do like the lady who said that you can wear a pirate shirt anywhere. I find her rather fun. Never apologize for who you are. Anyway, if I, I have... Let me see. I'll message Hendrix and ask if uh, they got this message about the jazz club, if they're going. Well, it, it's a uh, it's a flip phone, so it's going to take a little bit of time to text back. <laughs> uh, and it's... it's uh, I do want to point out that he doesn't uh, do any text talk or anything. He does correct grammar (laughs) Uh, on a flip phone, so it takes just a little bit of time to text. Uh, uh, But he texts back, uh, I received a phone call after performing some of my duties. Yes. Mm -hmm. I am on my way to this shadow world now. Never heard of it, but uh, I am usually busy. And that'll be it. So as you wait for like about 10 minutes to get all of this. (laughs) If Liliana allows Lee into the the Buick, he's sitting passenger seat. Just don't get mud in the carpets. It's hard to get out. It's fine. I could Amazon like a cleaning kit to the mausoleum. What does a raining forest have to do with a cleaning kit? It's a delivery service. They couldn't pick a better name. I don't own the company. It's not my choice of Noma. Or nomenclature? I I don't know. I'm not smart. (sighs) All right. Where are we going? Uh, Right up here. And Lee begins to direct Liliana away from the traffic to Shadow World. Awesome. Now, I'd imagine that with everything, just with all everything that's happened and hanging around for like five to ten minutes waiting for that text message, you would be the first to arrive. Um, because Shadow World is nicely located on the high street. You'd have to park somewhere and take the rest of the way on foot. But it's it's tucked away on the high street, surrounded by coffee shops and down a series of old cobble paths in traditional ye old English manner. Um You'd go down a small flight of steps that's narrow and surprisingly damp, given the weather. Um, You'd enter through these large doors, a wooden set of doors. They're black, and you find a small queue. There's about five to ten people currently in front of you, uh, Liana and Levin, for Lee, obviously. And shortly afterwards, you are joined by two others. Hendrix is the next one to arrive, Followed by Mira. And uh, as soon as Hendrix sees Mira, he's going to walk right up to them, embrace them, and first I'm going to rouse for Blush of Life. Ooh, I succeeded again. Oh, well, Mira is right behind you, so you just have to turn around or they tap you on the shoulder or whatever. Mm -hmm. I uh, Blush of Life so I can feel it. And I'm going to, uh, Hendrix is going to embrace them and give them a big loving embrace and kiss. And oh, how sweet. in all that uh, pageantry, Mira's also going to blush life. Okay. You do not get I hungry. also succeeded. Uh, would the other two be activating blush of life, just so we don't miss anybody out? No, but I will uh, put up sense the unseen. Hmm. No, because sometimes Lee forgets to. You know, that's totally understandable. We've got two different ends of the spectrum. One that doesn't give a shit, and one that hasn't quite worked out why he should be giving a shit. Um, Liliana, you don't see anything too out of the ordinary. Uh, I say that because there are a couple of ghosts that are lingering here. One is squatting on the corner of the floor in the fetal position, and one is standing next to the a, a large muscular bouncer, just sort of every so often looking them up and down. 
and looking around, not really paying that much attention. As we enter, uh, she'll nod to the ghost. The ghost will look a bit discombobulated, not used to being seen by seemingly mortal eyes. The one in the fetal position doesn't do anything, just sitting there. Mm. Would there be any exchanges between um, Nira and Hendrix as the lines are sort of shuffling forward? It was a lonely day without you by my side, my rose. Oh, you're going to make me blush in public, really? Well, it's a lot more fun than making you blush in private. Please, please. Um, they do, like, look beyond Hendrix for a second because they don't do lines. Uh, I would like to activate awe and just float past the riffraff. I am oh, following course. closely behind them. Oh, of, of course. I mean, and in that instant, and unless the other two kindred would wish to resist, um, everybody in the line is just sort of turning around and just checking out this yassified <laughs> beauty behind them. <laughs> it's the word of the night. Sort of, <laughs> absolutely. You saw, sort of, I'd imagine that together you would saunter towards the front of the line, mm-hmm. um, making a big old show and tell of it. Um, just despite being very flustered and starting to get a little hot under the collar, uh, the body cart is able to, well, bouncer was able to just about compose himself. And he looks at four of you. It's, it's like, <clears throat> mm, um, mm, um, t- table number four. And he's sort of gesturing inside the club. Good evening. And he's like constantly trying to avert his eyes away from you, Mir, but it's, it's failing miserably. And they float to the table. And I'm assuming everybody would follow suit? Of course. Uh, so you enter Shadow World. It's a small venue, uh, but there's a very, very smart and formal collection of round tables that are scattered, well, seemingly scattered in the centre of this club. There's there's a stage at the far end. There's like some gorgeous, ready, velvety curtains that sort of drop. It's almost like... Uh, the stereotypical theatre stuff with the big, thick uh, curtains. That sit. There's like a bar to the side. And there's people like mingling about, like getting comfy. Some people getting seats. Some people like chatting. There's, there's some small chatter. And on, on the stage, there's some um, instruments as well. There's a baby grand piano on the far left. There's um, somebody on stage in like black casual clothing, uh, fiddling uh, with a double bass. And as you mere enter, like you notice that it's, unless you wish to deactivate all, uh, they like flick their eyes back at you, like struggling to tune it up. And there's somebody like setting up microphones on a small little drum kit, like the cables just neatly organized along the stage. And all these different tables have little cards with numbers on them. And um, of course, all four of you see very easily number four. Um, is there smoking in the club? Uh, there is not uh, with English laws, unfortunately. But that said, the smell of cigarette smoke is very heavy in the air, which is odd for the reasons I just said. I dare say it almost adds to the the general vibe of the old school jazz days. Well, Hendrix is going to keep his cigarettes in his pocket just in case. So how have you two been? Hmm. How lovely to see you again, pup. Liliana, how have things been going with the uh, young one? Mm, He was crying on the floor earlier, but then he ate and he was better. (laughs) Children, you know how it is. You'll get used to it. I woke up rather peckish myself. Need a snack? Oh, no, thank you. I've already had my allotted treat for the evening. I appreciate the offer, though. Well, you know how it is. We do have to look out for each other now and then. Hmm. How long do we have to be here, by the way? That is a very good question. I didn't get many details over the phone. You were called? Yes. Called, not texted. Hmm. We were both contacted in text format. It was a male voice that I heard, however... I do not recognize it. Mm. So, so 
Is, is this like a vampire establishment or is this like just... Just a little bit lower, just in case. Mm-hmm. Is this like a vampire establishment <laughs> or... I have never been here. Usually too busy, though I am interested to hear what type of jazz they have to play. I doubt it'll be anything as refined as the old days, but it'll be nice to hear. As you're conversing with yourself, you're noticing people like getting seated. Um, It's difficult to tell whether the people around you are kindred or mortal. I mean, there's not like any immediate signs unless you were to start staring and checking people out. Everybody here looks quote unquote normal. Um, so they, there aren't like any Nosferatu or Samadhi about, for example. You're talking and people are getting situated. And then after a while, the lights dim. And a voice uh, sort of booms from a PA above you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, please give it up for tonight's host, Mr. Louis Davis. And there's a small round of applause, and there's a couple of cheers, and um, an individual who walks onto the, from the stage's right, there's a little spotlight on him. I can only describe physically, uh, it's between the weird love child between Roger Moore and Whispering Bob. Um, on top of this, he has a very interesting ginger bob. Uh, he's wearing like a black striped suit that kind of almost sparkles under this spotlight. And he's wearing like a maroon burgundy turtleneck. And when he opens his mouth to speak, uh, Hendrix, you recognize this voice. This is the voice that spoke to you on the phone. Hello, and welcome to Shadow World, the only jazz club bringing you all that is best in the international jazz scene. Groovy. And he stops there. It's like a couple of minor, minor chuckles. And uh, there's a clap here and there. It's probably some part of an inside joke or something. Um, Louis sort of looks around the club. He's sort of smiling with his wide grin. And he falters ever so slightly when he sees the four of you sitting around this table. Tonight, ladies and jelly spoons, we have a wonderful show planned for you tonight. Fab. An array of talented, award-winning artists have come to our humble establishment to provide an a oral experience like no other. We have the amazing Smoking Jellyfish Jones, Pot and the Kettle Black, Piles Mess, the sensational Nick Knack No Quartet, the Jeffrey James Jackson Johnson Jim Jam Joe Experience, and Amelia Prolapse. Great! Fab! Groovy! To start things off tonight, we have a very special performance. Our very own Marion de Rouge will be opening tonight's show with her rendition of the jazz standard Misty. Marvellous. She will be performing with her own band, Lux Tenebrae, with Doug Ed Green on double bass, Scat Pratt Twat on drums, and three-time Grammy-nominated pianist James the Skid Mark Hunter on keys. Mmm. Diatonic. So, without further ado... Let us welcome to the stage the sensational Marion de Rouge and Lux Tenebrae. Oh, and a bonus challenge. See if you can tap in time to those syncopated piano lines of the bridge section as the piece modulates from E-flat major to G-sharp minor. Crazy! Marion de Rouge and Misty. Brr. And as he's sort of wrapping up this rather eccentric introduction... These regular normal people sight sit at the piano, setting up the dr- bubble bass and the drums. And the last one to enter, and there's another an applause, uh, to a woman in her late 30s, perhaps early 40s. Um, she's wearing a black suit, a white shirt, unbuttoned ever so slightly, with long black flowing hair, who you can only assume is this Marion de Rouge, and she sort of smiles and she nods. And the stage and the lights all become a little bit darker, just so you can't really see the band behind her. It's just all focused on her. And she points at the piano, starts playing this very, very beautiful and intricate piano introduction. She opens her mouth and she sings with a voice that I could probably best describe is like an older, raspier Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, Misty is... Well, for those who know jazz, um, you would know the tune Misty to be one of the many standards. It's a it's a love song, and out of character, it's a very moving song, in my totally biased opinion. 
Um, and of course, uh, as Mr. Louis had described, it then goes to a more uh, a jivey sort of bridge section. The piano part gets a bit more out there, more stereotypically what people think is jazz. is just a whole mishmash of weird notes, but the crowd seems to like it. And those who listen to jazz would appre- might be able to appreciate it, might not be. If it, sound, if it sounds anything close to Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Hendrix is particularly uh, paying attention to it, as Ella Fitzgerald is his favorite artist. Hmm. But yeah, there's, there's there is a striking resemblance because um you know I imagine like an old as I said an older Haraspia version. It's with age, I'd say, um, an experience. And as this bridge section sort of ends, it gets into the more traditional, um, slow, more ballady stuff. Uh, you the four of you see Louis just coming over to you, and he says with like a hushed tone, "Hey there." Thanks for coming tonight. The tune is almost finishing. When there's applause and he points to a door by the side, just wait over there and I'll let you in. He sort of like pats some of you on the shoulders. He like heads over towards the door and you see him head over. And as Marion finishes her tune, there's quite the applause. There's someone that gives like a little wolf whistle and she doesn't say anything. There's no thanks or anything, but she smiles and she nods. And then she walks off through the stage left. This is sketchy, right? I'm just... I'm not the only one who thinks that, right? In this life, you had better get used to sketchy, pup. No, I've... I've experienced sketchy. I know what sketchy is. If I have to voice uh, Lee is standing up to go stand over during the applause. I'm sure it will all be all right. Who doesn't love backstage? Hmm. Pretend you're a VIP, dear. It'll go much smoother for you. I'm already VIP. We know. Always. <laughs> and sure enough, as you know, as one set of group of musicians leaves, another set arrives. Um, as the whole applause is like acting, sort the transition, I guess. Um, the door opens, and you find Mr. Louis Davis again with that same smile. Just like, come in. There's much to talk. You end in and go in and um, led through a small little... You're kind of going through backstage at this point, so it's not as fancy and as glamorous looking. There's some, you know, people like techies just sort of like moving right with like mics and things and and, and cables. Uh, there's like a couple of people like sitting on some boxes, like playing electric guitars. It's like it's not plugged into anything. You can just hear the occasional ting tang. Nothing huge. Uh, and you're led to a private room, uh, which just with the name Marion de Rouge on it uh louis just pushes open the door i won't be joining you this evening i have a show to put on but um i'll catch you cool cats later and he's like pats your shoulder liana and he sort of walks off if he touches me one more time he will lose that hand hand. yep there we go yep Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you all enter i'm assuming and it looks like just a rake well, I say regular dressing room. I mean, maybe some of you have seen these in real life. Maybe some of you haven't. Stuff from the movies. There's the, there is the mirror with the light bulbs around them. It's all lit up, and there's some like, like a little clothes rack to the side and things. And standing in front of like this sort of offset mirror, little dress up, like makeup sort of table bench thing, is Marion in the same outfit as before, and she's um, holding a cigarette in her hand. You'll probably notice as you're looking in front of, you're looking right at her, the mirror behind her, she bears no reflection. Uh, now Hendrix sees the uh, cigarette in her hand and he's going to pull out his cigarette and he goes, may I? Only once you've shut the door. He does so. She closes her eye and she nods as a, probably the closest thing that you ever get to her hearing a thank you. Good evening, Kindred. I apologize to tearing you away from your usual activities, but my sources tell me that you four are capable of getting work done in a near discreet manner. I would argue three, but please keep going. I didn't say it was you, but please out yourself. Hey, I'm trying. 
I'm aware of his capabilities. I am aware that the four of you are of varying different backgrounds, various different experiences to our ways of unlife. So and she looks at you, Lee. Perhaps this would be an opportunity for you to prove yourself that maybe you really are capable, despite your, from what I heard, rude introduction into this world. Thank you for the opportunity. She smirks, perhaps coldly. Now, this, under normal circumstances, would be a matter I would bring to the attention of the sheriff. And she looks at you, Hendrix. I'm pre- fairly sure that she knows already the activities, given how she likes to keep you fiend on a tight leash. But this private matter, and I would like it to remain private, has finally reached to the point where I can no longer contain it, and I am having to reach out to some individuals, individuals that could benefit from this cooperation, if you see what I mean. She takes a drag of her cigarette as she perhaps uses the silence for you to ponder on this opportunity. She removes the cigarette and she carries on speaking. You are me, you are probably aware that the city is currently undergoing somewhat of an interesting transition. The anarchs of our city are beginning to multiply like rats. It's disgusting. And some of the younger, lesser experienced members of our great yacht club, as I heard someone once describe it, are beginning to think that maybe opportunities and life for them is better, that they think the the grass is somewhat greener. They are clearly mistaken. One of those individuals, unfortunately, happens to be my child. She has been mixing with some unpleasant dregs of society. I'm more than certain to convince that there has been some supernatural means. Because one moment she was more than happy to be by my side, and the next she goes running away and playing games with the children. I would like you to find her and return her to me, just so I can have a talk with her just to make sure that is something that she truly wants. And you have it as my word in case you think I'm going to cause this kindred, who is purely a stranger to you, for harm. I do only want to talk and understand what is going on with her. Now, you may be aware, well, I highly doubt that you would be unaware, there is talk that the Lasombra numbers are gaining in multitudes that a primogen is needed. I hear certain whispers in court that the rest of the council are thinking of putting my name forward. This is a position that I would like, and if you were to deal with this part of this Anarch threat and aid the Camarilla, well, it would certainly do favours for me, and I'm very certain I'd be able to do favours for you in return. How does that sound? Uh, Hendrix is going to take a drag of the ci- of his cigarette himself. Let out a very satisfying puff. And he says, I am certainly willing to help you, my dear. Especially after that wonderful performance. Your flattery speaks volumes, but all the same. I appreciate the cooperation, especially from somebody of your, hmm, what would be a polite way of putting it, status. I I like the word status a lot. Perhaps one day it can be a little bit more official. Well, perhaps. Perhaps your mistress will let her little bitch off the leash, allow them to go and play a little bit more. Because the sheriff does have her own officials, you know. The hounds who do official stuff rather than the hand-me-downs that you're dealing with. And she smirks to herself. She takes another drag of a cigarette. Anyway, now is not the time for such petty talk. The rest of you seem to be awfully quiet, and I am sure you must have plenty of things to talk about. Typically, I'm not one for court games, surprisingly, but I'm welcome to a boon, minor, any. A wise and political choice. I do my best. 
Go on, little pup. Say what you want to say. Lee looks over to Liliana like, this is a good thing, right? We should do the guess? No, you're smirking. I don't like that. Uh, he has so much to learn. Mm, it's a good reason as any. I've got nothing better to do tonight. Well, isn't that fortunate? We'll help you. But I want Nosferatu eyes kept off of my haven. I'm sure such arrangements can be made. And I apologize that you have such unwanted attention. I couldn't work out why. And she sort of glares at Lee a little bit. That is how you get your Wi-Fi. Noted. So, you all agree. Fantastic. Or marvelous. As my little ghoul would say if he was doing one of his little performances. <sighs> Unfortunately, there is very little in much of information I can present to you. But I'll offer the very best that I can. My child is obviously one of my clan, the La Sombra. She has long strawberry hair, a pale face, and brown eyes. And before you think, well, that sounds very generic, generic she unfortunately has such a scar on her right cheek, a mishap of her embrace. She put up a bit more resistance than I would have liked. My knowledge and my sources tell me that she, the individual that she is running around with is an anarch by the name of Gary. Gary? I heard that name tonight, as it happens. Marion looks over to you specifically, because previously she's just sort of like looking in general around the space and you thought, but she looks at you with very intrigued eyes. Is that so? One of my hand-me-downs, as you put them, told me drop that name tonight. Hmm. What is it that this individual told you of them? <sighs> Not much. The sheriff stopped me before I could have too much fun. Though they did seem to have limited knowledge. They were just quote-unquote hungry. Hmm. Curious. So this Gary seems to have disappeared. Well, that's unfortunate. I am able to give you the location of his haven, at least. I would go and investigate myself, but as I said, I want this matter to done privately, and any associates of mine would draw unwanted attention. And she, she she's saying that she's sort of turning, finding a tissue, bit of tissue, and she is writing rather, well, as neat as her handwriting can be on a tissue, and she just holds her hand out for somebody to take it. Uh, as Lee is going to take the tissue, he has a hand raised. Yes. Um, so for this Gary character, what clan does he belong to in particular? Oh, I am I am unsure. From, from how Ella describes him, there's so much passion. He's this and he's that. It's such a such a chore. I'm assuming that he is one of the Bruja. So if you could deal with this Gary individual and return me my child, I will offer thee a boon. And should this matter allow me to ascend the rank of Primogen, you'll be awarded appropriately also. Are there any questions? I do, actually. You said one minute... She wanted to be by your side, and one minute she didn't. You suspect magic of, or discipline of some sort. Was there no falling out at all? No argument? Nothing? She sort of stops to think about that, looking at you. No, there was nothing. Things have always been a little tense. As most sire-child relations are, but nothing too out of the ordinary. All I really wanted to know. I'm assuming that you want this Gary permanently cut off from her? Ideally, yes. Discreetly would be preferred, but I sure won't hold any grudges to you if things get a bit more vocal, shall we say. That's all I need to know. No, I know why the pup was asked here. Just in case. Hendrix is going to, uh, to, uh, 
put out the cigarette. If there is nothing else that any of us need, I believe we are already burning midnight, as they say. I believe we should get started. That indeed sounds some fine advice. Because it may not look it, I have a club to run. Hendrix is going to uh, open the door and stand aside to let the uh, other three exit first. In the most uh, gentlemanly way possible. As they exit, uh, Lee pulls out his phone. Um, I have contacts and an information network as the um, bar, uh, the qualifier for that. Could I reach out to some of my n- discreet Nosferatu friends about the address? Uh, you certainly could, yes. Uh, you, I'm presuming you're doing this as you're leaving the facility. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll get a text message just as you're leaving the club and... Uh, you're told it's not that far. From, it's it's within the city. It's in a nice series of apartment blocks, and it's not too far from you. You could drive there. We could walk. Uh, well, one of my contacts says that it's not too far from here. If you all fancy a bit of a well, stretching your legs, as it were. Um, can I make a? politics role to try and glean anything I might have heard about this Gary character? Uh, you certainly can. Uh, uh, you can give me intelligence and politics. Now, as Anarchs aren't particularly of the huge... Unless you have a specialty for um, Anarchs in politics. I do not. Um, then going to need a significant number of successes to find anything tangible. Uh... That's three. That's as good as I could have done without a crit. You strain your mind trying to think if you heard anything that any member of the court has moaned about in and out of Elysia, anything that Olivia, uh, the sheriff, has said, anything at all, um, you can determine that Gary is simultaneously a mysterious and popular figure uh, within some form of the Anarchs, that maybe it's because he's mysterious that he's popular. Uh, the bit about being a very passionate individual is true. Um, but you do hear, you do remember that maybe that they were Kaitiff or Kaitiff rather than Bruja. Be a bit unsure. Mm-hmm. I'm actually going to bring this up. I've actually, uh, thinking about it, it is a possibility that this is not a bruja, but a caitiff we're dealing with, which politically we could probably pull something, but um, if we are brought to blows with this individual we might not know exactly what we're dealing with they can be a little a little bit unpredictable with their skill set right so still trying to wrap my head around this whole clan thing bruja caitiv sabat anarch camarilla i know we're part of the camarilla caitiv caitiv Yes. Are those without a clan? Whether there is something wrong with the embrace, or they just did not fit. So, if they, if this Gary is part of this non-clan faction, anything that happens to him could be done discreetly. No one's going to put probably a fuss about not. it. Caitiff aren't exactly looked fondly upon. However, again, if we come to blows, their skill set could consist of anything. As you're conversing this information with each other, uh, you're just sort of leaving the club. You uh, hear some hurried footsteps behind you, and you turn, and it's um, Louis once more. Hey there. I tell you, I'm, I'm not built for this sort of thing. He's all digging into a coat pocket. 
sweet Mary and forgot to give you this. And he holds a, a small, kind of like the sort of phones you'd find in a supermarket, like a, what I would call a drug dealer phone. Marion would like you to contact this phone. It has enough credit for one phone call. Call it and I'll respond. Let her know. Let me know what happens. Oh, burner. Nice. It catches fire. No, you're supposed to use it the one time and then burn mm. it. Ding dong. But and he sort of he waves the phone around a little in his hands and waiting for somebody to take it. Lee takes it. All right, you kids go and have fun. And he sort of like finger guns and he walks backwards into the club. So you are all headed towards, well, according to Lee, a series of apartment blocks. Now, how do you all get that? You all get there together. Do you all climb in the back of this ye old car. Do you go on foot? What's the plan here? Hendrix is going with Mira if Mira wants to take their car or their driver or whatever. Whatever Mira wants to do, Hendrix will follow behind. So are we taking the Buick, Liliana, or do you just want to walk? I don't want to pay for parking again. That's fair. Yeah, that's fine. I'll walk. Cool. I don't know what parking prices are like where we're at. (laughs) Well, I'd be able to answer that question if I knew, and if I thought about that for this definitely not fictional city. Um, anywho, so two of you walking, two of you are going by car. Yas? Or Yas, I should yes. say. Yas. Yas. <laughs> yes. All, right. All right, two walking, two going by the Yas wagon. Um, yas mobile, maybe? Sorry, focus. Um, these apartment blocks of fairly modern looking like maybe finished constructing the last couple years or so they're fairly tall um there's a few of them about but uh, through um these contacts you're able to pinpoint the exact block that it is um you also are able to work out that this particular room is on the top floor as you enter in it's a very very classy uh reception hall there's a couple of people like milling about coming and going there's some uh, people in some members of staff in rather fine uniform. What's next? How do you want to play this? Walk in. You and Hendrix can There's... punch something, maybe. Or we can. Okay. I mean, we have other options. You know, walk in, probably try some sort of social interaction mm-hmm. with the front desk and get more information I, on this Gary I fellow. I would like to check the office to see if there is. Um, perhaps mailboxes that are numbered, perhaps. Why is it always social interactions with you? Because <laughs> people like looking at me. Because sometimes punching isn't the answer. There's just a massive eye roll from Liliana. Lily, if you're worried, we'll, we'll take care of everything. I'm not worried. I just don't want to be here. Oh, understandably so. It's all over your face. You get wrinkles if you weren't like us. Even if you did, I could take care of it. <laughs> oh, you're so kind. What? That's actually really yes. useful. Do you want to look like somebody else sometime? Don't. Trust me. What? Do not want that. Uh, oh, are you sure? Thank you for the offer, Hendrix, but I will firmly and politely decline this offer. Good boy. Please, I'm a lot kinder than most of my kin. You wouldn't make a very lovely vase, I'm afraid. (laughs) What? (laughs) Nothing, dear. So, the office, then? Lead the way. Gladly. So you saw... So all four of you are going to try and locate some office... Mm-hmm. All right, so you're sort of perosy around, and you sort of follow what seems in the general direction of the office, and as you're approaching this door that's just labelled office, uh, there's like somebody outside that said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't come any more further than this. This um, It's staff only. That's, so, mm, that's such a tragedy. You see, we we have a friend we're looking 
we are looking for, but no, just a recent moving into this apartment. We're kind of not sure what apartment they're in. We were hoping to find an office, maybe locate a mailbox with their name on it to see where they are. Uh, this um, individual is a short ha- um, man. He's wearing he not wearing anything. The smart uniform, the short black hair, shaved sides. He's sort of giving you a puzzled look. Um, if you if you're looking for somebody, like take up a receptionist. Uh, Liniana, could you roll for me uh, wits and awareness? Oh. That sounded like a lot of dice. Two successes. Two successes. I will deal with that in a moment. I cut off Hendrix and I asked you to make that roll. We were just wanting just... Oh, we just didn't want to bother anybody. We thought it would be faster this way. Yeah, um, it probably would be fast this way, but it's, you're not really supposed to just... Go and ask receptionist, and as he gestures of his hand, um, you know, back towards the receptionist, Liliana, you catch a glimpse of the top of a tattoo that's like poking through the sleeve of his arm, just showing his wrist. You think you recognize a little bit of it? Lovely ink work you have there. Hmm? Oh, this. And he sort of like pulls down his uh, sleeve a little bit. And when he reveals more of the design, you see it's kind of like what you'd imagine like a child's drawing of a snake skeleton, but with like the drawing of a skull. Uh, But Liana, this actually means a bit more to you. This is a symbol belonging of the Bahari, meaning human. Hmm. You know, our friend might be involved with workings of the Dark Mother. Are you sure you can't help us out? When you say that, his eyes just widen up like he's just had the biggest surprise of his life. He says, oh, shit. Um, He sort of looks around, making sure that nobody's watching. Um, Come here. And he sort of directs you towards what appears to be a cleaning room. Hendrix kind of whispers to Liliana, and you didn't want to talk to anybody. I still don't. So it's a cleaning room. There's some people that's just cleaning, and um, this individual, he's like very politely, like just suggests to them how he's like makes a thing that you're like inspectors or whatever that's pretending to um, be ordinary um, guests of the hotel. You know, so some stuff. They sort of look a bit confused. They, some of them make a fuss saying they weren't expecting this, that, and the other. But he, uh, this guy with the tattoo, he, he gestures them out. And when he, they do that, he shuts the door behind them. It's like, whoa, okay. Um, mm, mm. So, what? She'll just gesture to uh, to the others. My companions here are looking for someone, as am I. Think you can help us out? They might be in this building. I mean, I'll certainly help another sister out. Yeah, sure. Uh, Steve. You can call me Lily. She'll give an uncharacteristically warm smile. He's unsure what to do with that. He smiles back. He's clearly nervous. Um, but he he smiles back. It's like, pleasure. Um, yeah. Um, what's up, Lily? Um, yeah, who, who are you looking for? What was the description again? Uh, young woman, scar above the eye. Um rattles off the rest of the details. I thought it was he sort right of thinks, cheek. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right cheek, sorry. Uh, he sort of thinks a little bit. You know, I have seen somebody that's come through here recently, not for the last couple of days, though, like coming and going constantly. Um, goes up to a room on the top floor, stays there uh, for the night, leaves the next, comes back, just rinse and repeat. Um, he hasn't been here for a while, not since the um, whole, there was an incident up top, like a, a, a burglary or something, something happened. I hope the police were here and dealing with it. And she hasn't been here since. 
What room was that? Uh, room 421. It's like right at the top. See, that seems like a good place to start. You wouldn't be able to get us a key or let us in, would you? <laughs> and he sort of ponders a little bit. All right, just go away outside, you know, just by, just not here, just... And he sort of like flusters and he just sees himself out, like encouraging you to follow him. Um, while this is going on, could I browse the web for the police report regarding the break in here? Oh, uh, you can certainly try. Uh, what would be a adequate role for that, I wonder? Um, I will allow either wits investigation or wits and tech, technology rather, whichever one of those is higher for you. I've got four successes. Four successes. Well, you know that there was, very clearly there was some sort of fight and the room, apologies, I should have had that muted. Try that again. Um, four successes. Uh, you were aware that there was, the, as uh, Steve had said, the whole room's a mess. The police are here. The room is kind of being sectioned off currently. Um, but there's not really much you can find about that. And you can sort of read in between the lines that whoever, that somebody has attempted to cover a lot of this information. All the information you've seen has been very vague, that there was a scuffle the rooms a mess you've seen some pictures and indeed this presumably was once a very nice looking hotel room was um it's an, it's you know it's a mess uh to put it nicely does the police report say that it's an active crime scene right now are we going to expect like a presence there aside from what we think is going to be there um it does appear to be an active crime scene but you could probably work out that Steve is like trying to get you to have a look, that maybe there aren't any police officers up there currently. All right, so let's be careful when we're poking around. It is an active crime scene, so anything we leave behind might get picked up. Don't want to breach the masquerade, right? That That's something we say, right? Mm, it certainly is. Well, um... Not very good at looking myself, but I can, of course, keep watch just in case there is company. I can always slow them down if they were to interrupt us. Um, I would also like to uh, mentally call my familiar <laughs> to see if uh, Wyvern could please help them look <laughs> in his place while... He is out. It will take some time mm -hmm. for the cat to arrive. Yes. That is why I'm doing it now. <laughs> it's a good idea. Uh, but yeah, Steve returns back. His face is like a bright red and he's clearly sweating. He hands you over. Um, he's like waving a key about, I'm just doing this for official sake. Like, I've told them that you're investigators. Don't touch anything. I'll lose my fucking job. I really need this job. And he hands the key to you. Uh, Liniana. Thank you so much for your cooperation. You're welcome. Hey, hey, Lilithu. And he sort of like scuffles off. What? No, I just thought that was really cool. Someone retrieving a key was cool. No, I mean like the whole click thing, like Hail Hydra, Hail Hydra. The reference is going to be lost on you, never mind. Hendrix is vacant. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, Hill. What? It's like he's talking about the TikToks and Book of Faces again. It's just very interesting that inside of these sects, there are different sects that cooperate with one another, okay? I When I was alive, that, uh, that uh, hand gesture meant something very, very different. Oh, yeah, no. We should watch a movie sometime so that I'm not taken out of context here. Maybe. Anyway, the room, please. I have called Wyvern to help you all look. I will be keeping a lookout, as I said, just in case you are possibly interrupted. I might be able to buy some time with a distraction. 
I'm not very good at investigating myself. All right, then. Onward and upward. Literally, indeed. Um, Heading towards the back of this reception area, there is a series of lifts. You have a look at the top to see, okay, which one takes you where? And one in the far right-hand side, and there's a lift that takes you all the way up to the desired floor. Um, Perhaps to the pleasure of everybody here, there is, well, the three of you, there is no... um, Muzak, there's none of that traditional cheesy elevator music. It's just a dry, warm buzz of the ascending of the lift. You're in there for a short while. There's a little ding as the doors slide open. And to your left and right, there's a series of doors, like very nice carpet, and wooden floors, uh, except one door, um, which has got like yellow police, like do not enter, keep out sort of tape there. Um, it's a bit weird that Steve gave you the key uh, because the door is currently off its hinges. It's sort of swinging a little bit. Hmm. Pushes it open with a finger. As you do that, the door just falls off and there's a loud bang as it hits the ground. Oops. Oh, that's fine. I don't think anyone heard. Odds are easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Odds. So do you go in? Yes. Um, yes, assuming that Lee, well, Lee, if you hadn't have showed the pictures, well, the couple pictures that were up there, then yeah, it's this room is definitely a mess. There's the mattresses of the the mass, the king signs beds all torn, the duvets things all torn. There's claw marks on the wall. There's broken furniture, there's smashed window. Like there's been a you didn't see those claw marks there for sure, but this, this place is definitely had been in one interesting of a mess, shall we say. Either this is very, one very sloppy breaking and entering, or someone let an animal in here. Have you been in here before? No, can't say I have. It doesn't really fit with my own MO. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> well, there went the joke. Whoosh. And she'll actually reach up to do a whooshing motion with her hand over Lee's head. There's a huff as Lee begins to skulk about. Um, between the banter, I would like to activate heightened senses, please. Sure. Now, traditionally, heightened senses is an activation of all the senses. Uh, but I prefer the somewhat older ruling of the system where you can pinpoint a particular sense you wish to heighten. So, what would that be for you? Um... I'm going to go with sight, even though like there's some glaringly obvious things going on, but uh, Mira's looking for the finer details. Hmm. In just the whole scen- scenery, or is there something in particular that strikes your eye? Um, the scenery, for now. Okay. Um, if anybody wants to do like a general um, wits and investigation, uh, you may. I got uh, two successes. Three successes for me. Too many screens, three successes. <laughs> That's fine. So two, three, three. Okay. Lee, you're sort of looking around. I don't know, maybe be lifting up things or just looking around. And you're just thinking, yeah, some shit's gone down here, huh? Um, like you can't really pinpoint other than some big old fight. It's like happened. Like there's too much stuff to take in. Um, yes. Um, particularly, has anything been, anything been taken? Like, or is there a space on the wall where a painting used to be? Or um, there might have been. There's there's some um, photo frames, like, I guess, generic scenery stuff that's, like, askew. The frames have been smashed. But it doesn't look, from what you can see in Worko, you can't see that anything, like, "Mm, there should be something there, but it's not. Um, Liniana, you're sort of, like, again, looking through, like, again, well, it's a fucking mess here. Um, But you're... You and Miria are able to work out, okay, maybe this isn't exactly a normal sort of fight. Uh, you and the idol going through, a, like looking underneath the bed, you've noticed a, a slim laptop, which is mostly unscathed. There's like some grazing on the, on the back of the screen. Um, but currently it seems functional. Um, similarly with you, Mira, you're sort of looking around you're looking at these claws marks on the wall and you're thinking 
Yeah, this definitely isn't a doll. There's definitely some sort of supernatural things going on here. Pull that laptop out from under the bed. Can you look on the Facebooks to see if there's anything about whoever owned this on there? Sure, I'll give it a shot. You open the laptop up and um, surprisingly it wasn't shut down. You just open it up and it's just there's appearing on a, a lock screen. It's a G-I as in I as in the things you see with. Tech intelligence? Okay. Mm-hmm. So you can work out the passwords for it. I've got four successes, no crits. Ooh. Um, you make a few attempts, for sure. And it starts off by you overthinking it, like what it could be, but it you then able to work out, what, and maybe it's one of the really simple passwords, and it's literally password one, two, three, asterisk. And uh, it boots up onto a home screen. There's very little on there. It's like a generic, like, Windows 10 background. Um would you want to go poking around for? There are going to be several uh, windows popped up. One is going to be like their web browser, if there's any social media attached to this account. The second one is diving into any of the more recent files that the person had accessed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you like open up the various social media things and you see that there is a the Book of Faces account or Facebook uh, to the Yunnans listening. <laughs> um, it's again just um, very bare, very basic nothing there, it's like no profile picture or anything, just like the generic bluey um, body portrait for lack of a better word um, and there is one contact again with a very uh, similar profile uh, with E you're sort of reading through these messages that exchange between them and it's explaining that this is um, obviously uh, a conversation between Gary and Ella, that Ella isn't uh, actually the one typing. She explains a little about the less, sort of less sombre thing, like trying to dance around the thing. She can't use technology for some reason. Um, there's this whole discussion about how she simultaneously loves... Um, constantly refers to Gary as grey rather than the information you're told but also loves Marion she can't make up her mind and this that and the other and this is conversation between these two and the latest thing that you find um, is grey Gary sending a message to Ella to tell them to meet them by their special place in the woods do all kindred talk in like It'll show the rest of the group the message. Cryptics. What do you mean? It seems pretty straightforward to me. Agreed. I don't know, maybe like an address or something. Geo-coordinates. It's never, hey, meet me at the corner of 5th and 3rd. I have the weed. Well, if it's a place that they've traveled to often, it's common enough to them. How recent is this message? Um, two nights ago. Which is roughly the time that Marion said that she just disappeared. Is there like a kindred equivalent to eloping? Is that asking in or out of character? Yes. <laughs> 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 Not well. It seemed, it's a bit more complicated than what you immediately presented. We should probably try and figure out where their special place in the woods are. Might have some clues there. Oh, that's fine by me. This place is... Horrid on the eyes. As you say that, Mira, you the three of you hear like a tapping at the window, and you look and you see that there is a cat just sitting there. It's like meowing, wanting to get in. And that cat climbed a pretty high way up on the outside. Um, Mira's gonna fetch the cat. Uh, could you give me a charisma and animal ken roll, please? Oh no, I forgot. <laughs> animals aren't a thing uh luckily i have hella charisma uh one success <laughs> one well the cat whilst being very suddenly aggressive as you begin to approach them uh hissing at you uh you do open the window and the cat sort of like slinks around you like the cat has forgotten it's got a spine it doesn't have a spine it just sort of like weaves around you and it starts beginning to sniff and look around the room 
And as it does so, like constantly giving the three of you the evil eyes, um, it heads into a little, well, it's fairly large bathroom. It just starts howling. What's it doing? I think it found something. I'll get it. And uh, they saunter on over to the bathroom. It, not even the bathroom managed to um, escape whatever was going on here. Uh, once beautiful white tiles have all been destroyed, a, a massive um, chunk has been taken out of this porcelain sink, and there are just clothes, uh, like, all in shreds, just spread everywhere. Uh, there's also... Um, one of those outlines where you, you would have found a body previously adjacent to said clothes. Um, with the outline, is there any blood? There are some stains there. Quite a lot. All right. Um, would the, like, would the blood stains correspond with the date in the messages? Is Are they, like, two days old around that area? Um... I think it would be a bit difficult to you to work out how old the bloodstains are, but it would make sense. They're nearish the outline of the body and everything else that's... Well, yeah, the outline of the body. It makes sense that unfortunately that someone or something got hurt or super hurt, the fatal hurt, as it were. <laughs> the big ouchie, yes. uh, as it is. The lethal oops. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they're... Um, just going to jut their hand out from the room and like call the other two over. Oh, oh, that was not mentioned in the. Uh... Okay. Well, we can give this interesting one last look over, and then we can go find their rendezvous in the woods. If anybody would like to give a little search over in the bathroom, that would be a wits and investigation. I'd like to use sense the unseen and see if anyone's around. Mm. With the power of your Vita, you tap into the mind's eye once more and you look in the room that most probably wouldn't look around in the room, scanning, feeling, just being aware of the surroundings beyond more. And you don't seem anything here. There's no spirit as there was before. There's no... I don't know, hiding Nosferatu in the bathtub, it's, um, empty. Um, hi, uh, question. What does a one on the blood die mean? Well, that depends. If you got a failure overall, that would be a bestial failure. Okay. Okay, um, yes, then. There were no successes there. So you got a bestial failure. What did you two... Get. I got a good old one. One success. One success. Um, starting with that, uh, you know, on par with the description I gave a moment ago, you and Mira just like thinking, yeah, some shit's happened in here. Um, whoever that person was, like, rip, I guess. Um, but then there's you, Lee. You're frustrated that, you know, you were doing so well trying to help out, and now you just feel like a total hit you feel annoyed you feel angry and you're just feeling so <sighs> you, you, you don't can't really find the words for it and just the other two you see sort of like lee just scratching himself like he's sort of picking it away at his clothes and he's just sort of possibly like growling and snarling to himself a little bit seems very agitated to put it politely everything all right there heavy clothes well, you can strip down once we get to the woods. I can teach you a new dance if you like. Hunt. Hungry. A bit. Hard. To talk. Um, having lived with Lee for a while, do I know if feeding him would help him? It would, it would after a period of time, but it's just kind of need to leave him to... Work things out, I guess. Okay. The cat, by the way, is like visibly frightened by this 
it's almost like Lee was giving us some sort of weird aura or pheromone to the cat's picking up on. And when Lee is like sort of picking at the clothes and he's like a bit more, uh, the cat bolts out through the window again. I think <laughs> Lee will just cover his mouth with his hand and air, going for air. <clears throat> If you need one of your Capri sons, I have your silly straw. Is there anything else that you would wish to do in here? Or Mm-mm. I think that's it. Cool. So the three of you make your way out. Lee, the most com- uncomfortable of them all, not liking the environment. The, the glare of the light seems a bit more unpleasant. You feel your feet just move about in your socks a little bit, like this weird cotton puppet just playing with your toes you don't like how it's slipping and sliding about this leathery thing on your foot your shoes it's just everything is just holding and clawing and just dragging you down and it's just there's a part of you that just wants to strip off and just free yourself of whatever's going on um going down the lift is a very similar um experience trapped in a a glassy shell the humming is just a bit too much. To you, it almost sounds a little bit like some sort of animal that's growling as it's pulling you down. Um, and this carries on as you return into the reception. Um, where you've, What would Hendrix be doing at this point when I would say you, the cat would arrive through the front door with you, Hendrix? Uh, Hendrix was uh, just smoking a cigarette outside, keeping watch, as he said. Uh, if, uh, Wyvern, uh, if Wyvern, like, jumped down to him, he'd be greeting him, uh, probably letting Wyvern get up on his shoulders to ride, uh, looking back, seeing, uh, seeing, uh, Lee, he would probably, uh, Put out the cigarette and mm. walk in and greet him. When those elevator doors slide open, it is like the start of the dog races. Lee bolts from inside of the elevator and towards the opening, uh, the open mm-hmm. door. Um, Hendricks just steps aside, holds the door open so he doesn't break anything. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that this still counts as the same scene. I imagine there's like a growl towards you and you could, uh, Hendrix, and it might have been construed as a thank you. Best stay out of his way for a bit. He has the zoomies. So much for crate training, I'm assuming. Mm. Hmm. They grow up so fast, but they still come with their challenges. Well, scratching Wyvern's chin, he's just like, what the hell happened in there? There was a cat. Yes, this is Wyvern. Wow. Did you do good, my darling? Did you help? Wow. Yes, my darling. <laughs> oh, I'm so wow. glad you could help, dear. I'm sure you helped them so much. Wow. And this time Mira ro- uh, rolls her eyes so long. It's a full-length feature film that I roll. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, are you jealous? Not paying you enough attention. I don't get jealous over cats, or dogs for that matter. Mm. And speaking of dogs, we should catch up with our own. There are a pair of sneakers and socks at the door of the Buick. There is a shirt and jacket at the door of the Buick. And I imagine Lee is not there. I take it that Lee's just heading his way. Into the forest. <laughs> mm-hmm. In the nude. Or as near as nude as he's prepared to get. He has the Hulk pants on. It's fine. <laughs> Liliana will collect his clothes. <laughs> Into the... In, uh, y'all probably realize why she carries such a large bag. <laughs> this has happened before. Um, I also <laughs> got a success for rousing mm-hmm. the blood. For a blush of life, because I imagine Lee wants to feel the Mm. wind on his skin. Duly noted. So. Feel the wind on your (laughs) skin. (laughs) 
<laughs> so the four of you, through your own means, are heading into the woods on the outskirts of the city. If it gets particularly dark, uh, Hendrix is going to activate Eyes of the Beast. And it would be at the woods where this would come into play and your eyes illuminate that crimson red like some vampire night vision is essentially what it is. Just tall, deciduous forest as far as the eye could see. Well, if it was daytime, you'd be able to see pretty far, but it's just volumes upon black. Hendrick, you can, you know, see your way around. And, of course, there wasn't much information to go off of. The fact that you all um, exchanging bits of information about what you found, what you saw. Um, so I'm assuming that Hendrick would be leading the four of you, unless anybody else has any similar abilities to... Lee also has Eyes of the Beast. Uh, you may activate that. I would say this is a new scene. By the time you're running through the nude, it's like feeling the warm wind just sort of like drag you on your... I wouldn't say almost feeling one with the beast, because you're... Maybe it would be. The beast not feeling comfortable with the restrictions of these man-made items. And activating the blush of life to retain onto that humanity. It's this almost like a strange dueling going on, even though using your vampire blood to feel more human. But it's, your humanity does win, and you're able to collect yourself, and hopefully your clothes win. I Anna imagine arrives. everyone's grouped up at the forest. They hear, because I also have Silence of Death for Obfuscate. Um, mm. They hear like some leaves rustling, and they see Lee just fall out of a tree with a branch in his hand. Okay. Doggy. And that, that's essentially what snaps him out of it. Fair enough. Doggy went to go and play fetch with some trees. Need me to throw that for you? No. I think I'm good now. Where'd my shoes go? They're in my bag. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Assume, I was going to say, assuming that you get dressed and you wish to activate Eyes of the Beast, the four of you shall explore the forest. Mm-hmm. Uh, could I get all of you to do me a wits and survival? Uh, standard difficulty is f f uh, three successes, I believe. Uh, but with those with Eyes of the Beast, that takes it down to two. Okay. Uh, I would like to. I would like to blood buff my wits. Mm -hmm. So that requires a rouse check. And the blood dies. I I succeed. I'm getting really lucky. Hmm. But how long will Lady Luck smile upon you, I wonder? <laughs> I hope I hope it comes Three in successes. when it counts. That's all we can hope for. Three successes. Mm -hmm. Dice gods uh, one success. success. Gods give two successes, one of them being a ten on the blood die. Uh that is two successes for me. Hmm. So um two for messy critical for you. Yep. At Lee. Well, the good news is that you all managed to at least make your way through safely, like following your uh, undead guides, as it were. Lee, whilst you know, very much in control of themselves, you do seem to be a bit more attuned with your environment a bit more, that you seem to be the one leading the charge. Ever so it's like you and Hendrix are sort of leading the charge, but Hendrix seems to be a bit... It's like Lee seems to be a bit more enthusiastic obviously being attuned to nature a bit more. Like, where Hendrix slips up, you seem to be pointing in a decent direction. And you keep wondering for what feels like about five, ten minutes. There's no, um, no real indication whether you're making any real progress. But you do spot, or rather your beast spot, all in unison, perhaps, um, a large bonfire with an individual kneeling in front of it. Does this spark fear in us <laughs> at all? Your beasts are very much aware of it at the moment because you're not too close to it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wish to go and investigate it, okay, it, your beasts might have other things to say and do. Hendrix would like to go. He does have a good amount of willpower. Lee is going to slink into the shadows, still being very much torn between wanting to go and then also this impulsion inside of him. Mm -hmm. So 
you're heading towards the flame, but you're also like taking like a detour round. Yeah, it? we'll we'll say if there's a spot where he can essentially watch the scene fold out, but not being viewed himself. Okay, I understand. Liliana will head towards it too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mira's going to use common sense and sure. stay back. So, Liana and Hendrix, as you approach the flames a bit more, there's slight uncomfortable twinge in you. It's like, oh, fire's bad. Keep your distance. The beast is kind of like thinking, what are you doing? No, stay away. Fire's bad. Fire's bad. Could you two uh, now make me a frenzy check and spend your unspent willpower? That is four successes. Twins! I also got four successes. Hey, twinsies! Mm. The Lamy, eh? Um, forever in charge of her own destiny as various members of the, her clan before them able to control the sensations of wanting to flee, run, and scream away from this big ball of fiery death. And the dragon, once more, is able to tame the beast. And you are able to approach the individual, um, kneeling, his hands on his, the, his, hand, his palms on his thighs, and he's got his eyes sh- shut. He's a man in his late 30s, early 40s. He's pretty muscular. He's wearing like a denim sleeveless jacket. Um, there's a sort of a vest sort of thing, cargo trousers, and he's, his hair shaved. Um, his head is also shaved like a black ponytail that just goes all the way back. He's sort of breathing in slowly and outwards. I hope we're not interrupting anything. Uh, he continues his breathing, and but he opens one eye and looks at you, and he stops. He opens the other one. I thought I could see, feel the presence of your ilk. He stands up, brushing the mud off of his uh, calves. He stands about six foot tall, and he crosses his arms. Do you seem lost? Mm, Not lost. We are looking for somebody. Others of our ilk, as you would say. They have a location in the woods. If we can find them, we will be on our way. He slowly nods, and you can see that he's, like, poked his tongue on the inside of his mouth, like, just clearly annoyed. Right. I'm assuming that Las Ombra woman sent you to claim back what rightfully belongs to her. Mm. She is... It wasn't so much that wording as it was more concern. I'm sure she is very concerned that her chilled child, whatever, has stood up for herself. She does not want to be there. She wants to be here with me. Well, we don't intend on staying very long. We'll be leaving tonight. And where would she be now? Is she incapable of speaking for herself? Of course. He gestures on. He gestures towards. She's. There's a river that runs through here. She's just over there. You may speak to her if you wish. Hendrix will put his like hand over his heart and give him a very polite bow. Liliana just turns and walks away. I assume that Hendrix would follow suit. Mm-hmm. As you both walk away. Um, this individual just shout, one thing. I don't know who or what you can do, but I know enough about your kind to know that you can do mind tricks. If I believe that you have done anything to her mentally or physically, I will destroy you. Dear, the only thing I intend to do is give her the freedom to choose for herself. Then you have... More respect than the others that have come here, come looking for us. She will leave here by her own choice, if she so wishes. Very well. Very well. And he will stand there, 
and watch you walk into the woods. What would Lee be doing at this point? He's watching the exchange and when the others leave to go talk to um, Olivia, was it? Um, Ella. Ella, thank you. Um, To Ella, he'll kind of slink out of the bushes. Not a... Get within um, a few feet of the bonfire, but not like it's still keeping him away. And he'll just watch Gray. Mm -hmm. He's not doing anything. You sort of see him from an angle where he's just staring intently at these two heading towards Ella. What do you... uh... Hmm. How do you feel about Ella? He sort of turns round and he looks around for you. Ah, another. Are there any more of you hiding in the bushes? I think I'm the only one who went into the bushes. Hmm. Pretty sure. Right. (sighs) To be honest, I adore Ella like no other. And many think it's foolish. Garu and Kindred. Yes. I knew he was a werewolf. (laughs) I heard Ilk and I was like, that's a werewolf. (laughs) For you audio cast listeners, both for Lee and RJ, this comment goes over their heads. Actually, no, I quite remember a lore by night where you said run. Don't stick around. Don't fight. Fucking run. Bonus brownie points for you, good sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry. I'm kind of new to this whole kindred politics thing. Um, so what you're doing is wrong, correct? Well, by Camarilla standards? What we're doing is wrong by all sorts of standards. Vampire and Garou have been enemies since time memoriam there is a sense i could feel that you were coming before you could see me there is a taint of pure evil about you all and most of you prove time and time again that you're nothing but dirty manipulators but with ella there does seem to be some hope so it's a Montague Capulet sort of situation, except well, one of you is already dead. Got it. In a sense, yes. Although, if we stay much longer, we'll both be dead. Either her undead superiors will come looking for her and be rid of her, or those of my pack. I am already disowned by them. It won't be long until they come looking for me. And not even I will be able to protect Ella from all of them. So what is your plan, then? We plan to wish to leave the city, which is collecting our belongings, giving our farewells. Ella is just sitting by the river, something that she used to do in her mortal years, and then we'll be leaving tonight, never to return. Do you mind if I stick around a bit, then? My friends are over there. You may. But my same intentions go to you, too. If you do anything I deem to be untoward, I will destroy you. Likewise, if you come at me with this energy, I will do everything in my power to unalive you. He nods and he sort of like tilts his head side to side and there's like loud cracks as he does so. Lee begins to stretch. If shit goes sideways, at least I'll be ready to fight. Uh, What is... Mira, or Miria, uh, do doing all of this? Um, I would have hoped to do some professional eavesdropping with heightened senses just to stay in the loop. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that, activating your senses, the as well as the conversation, you hear like the gentle, well, once gentle, like nature noises, like birds, little chirps sound like massive cries. The wind seems a bit more forceful, and the leaves sounds more like almost to the level of white noise, but. More importantly, you're able to pick out every detail of the the conversation that's happening between uh, Lee and Grey Eye. Understood. And um, where is Lily and Hendrix? Uh, they had gone off to forward to 
by the side of a river to speak to Ella to see where she wishes to be. And I think that is where we will push the thing forward. Uh, you head there and there's a, a torch, like a bright on a tripod sort of torch that's like pointing into a river and you see uh, this a woman that m matches the description that Marion gave you. Uh, she's wearing like a, a peachy top um, and some jeans, like bright colours that don't really think, ah, that's a La Sombra. Um, just looks like anybody else. Although she does seem a little uncomfortable in the presence of the light. The torch, it's not, is it electric? It's not. Uh, it's an elect yes, it's an electric like LED torch that's like mostly pointing at this river, mm -hmm. but some of it's like getting her in the face. It's not flickering at all in her presence or anything. No, it's no flickering. It's working it as it should. That's what that's what uh, Hendrix is going to comment on first. Funny, I I thought such things couldn't work in your presence. Uh, when she hears your voice, she like startles and she, like leaps to her feet. And she sees you and Liliana presumably close behind. It's like, who are you? Apologies, I did not mean to interrupt, interrupt or startle you at all. My name is Hendrix, and this is Liliana. She's sort of flicking her eyes between the two of you. It's like, I've heard your name before, Hendrix. You, yeah, I've seen you around the sheriff a few. And she sort of puts her hand sight on her face. Oh, sweet baby Jesus, Marion sent you, didn't she? She did. She did. Oh, fuck. Please don't take me back to her. Why? Why don't you want to go? Because I can't stand it anymore. It's suffocating. And this is someone who can't breathe. It's... It started off so nice between me and her, but she's just gotten too controlling. It's, it's worse than live, when I was living with my mum. It's just, I can't do anything. I can't say anything. This happened a couple of times. I couldn't feed without her fucking permission. Mm. Have, she says she loves me, but she treats me like the shit on her shoe. Have you spoken to her about these issues? Yes! Loads of times. Oh, I'm just doing it to protect you. And she's all like sways her arms to her side like poorly mimicking her uh, Marion's general um, demeanors. But I don't want to be that. I don't want to be part of all of this. I want to be here. It's grey. Is he okay? Did you do anything to him? Of course not. He's sitting. He came to talk. He's sitting by the fire, safe and sound. <sighs> okay. <sighs> I can't go back there. And what was your plan? I'm going to run away with Grey. Find some place to herself. <sighs> away from the Camarilla, away from vampires, away from whatever the Jihad is. Away from his wolf pack, Feeny, these what, the bone gnawers or whatever. Just a... I don't... Just away. Just together. How long has it been since you were embraced? Two years. She's just a child. How, if you were to run away, how long do you think this fairy tale would last? You and this Grey, is it? Yes, um, Grey Eye, he's blind in one eye. He was like that when he was born. That was just the name that he was given. For some reason, some of the vampires call him Gary. They think he's one of them. He seems very intelligent. But the way he was so calm in front of the bonfire, I have to imagine he is not one of us. Oh, no, he's a, he's a, he's a werewolf. We call them Lupine. He calls himself Garou. It's, yeah, he's, 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 so, he's so deep, so intelligent. He's, he talks about a lot like nature and spirits and there's some grand presence called Gaia that's protecting the earth. It's so interesting. Mm. It's really interesting. My dear, do you know what happens to kindred as they get older? I didn't think we aged. We, we do not age externally, but internally we do age. 
In fact, we age a lot. You can even say we decay emotionally from the inside. You find him deep now. Perhaps you'll even find him deep in 10 years. But eventually, he won't be deep anymore. And you'll make a mistake, or he'll make a mistake. And eventually, either your corruption or his values will get in the way of this relationship. And I really, really do not think that you want to experience that kind of hurt. Could you give me charisma and persuasion? Uh, can I add my stunning to this? Yes. Does that add one or two die to that? Two. Then you absolutely... Then I will allow that. Uh, that is an eight with a critical. Beats my roll by one. She stares very sadly, summonly at the ground, the dirt. Just... If she could, well, like, cry intensely, she would. This is a very sad and troubled woman. You basically, politely, destroyed her life, her future with this individual as she, the cogs begin to turn. It's like thinking that she doesn't want anything bad to happen to him. She just nods. So you're saying for his safety I should come back, that I should end this? Yes, my dear. It is a hard decision, I know, but that is how and what we are, and I am sorry. She sniffs as if she has a runny nose. Perhaps it's more the habit of anything else that she's aware that she's going through the bodily emotions of cry silently crying to herself. Uh, there are no tears yet, but there's like you can see with the line of things, like her body's like going through the the shunting things as you sniffing that, as if she is crying, but there are no tears. Perhaps her undead state is preventing her to exhibit these emotions, and she nods and sort of rubs her nose and her eyes. Just could I at least say goodbye? Of course. Of course. Uh Sorry, as Gray and Lee are doing their ritualistic stretching before combat, um, Lee just turns, Hey, by the by, what's up with the body in your bathroom? That's what happens when you send somebody who can't do their job properly. Huh. Respect. Oh, I have your laptop, by the way. Do you want that back? Hmm. I did wonder where that went. It was like under the bed. Hmm. Must. Curious. I won't be needing that. You keep it. I will wipe your hard drive. It would be at this moment that the free return by the riverside. Um, you see a woman, Lee, and a mirror who matches the description that Marion gave. And she looks very distraught. And Grey Eye picks up on this. Ella, what has happened? What have you done to her? It's great. Don't. We need to talk. In private. He looks between the, the three of you. He looks back at Ella. Sure. Anything. And they sort of walk away together into the darkness and they're gone for a, a few minutes you hear muffled shouting Mira you probably hear the conversation more uh, you hear Ella talking about how it's not safe that over time someone's going to make a mistake motions all that stuff basically just poorly parroting the stuff that Hendrix described earlier on um, Grey Eye is clearly very angry by all of this but 
you do when there's a bit of silence of all of you and Mira, you hear that he's accepting of this. All of you hear a howl, a big old wolf howl, and you hear like charging, like heavy footsteps away from all of you. And Ella comes through, returning back to you. This time, not as easy as it were, probably a bit tetchy with the flame. And now there are a couple of blood droplets trickling from her eyes. Just okay. I hand, Let's go. I hand her like a handkerchief from my suit jacket. She looks at you begrudgingly and she snatches the thing away and just stabs her eye. Should I phone in then that job's done? Would you like another night away before you return? She thinks about it for a moment and just, just shakes her head. No, let's. I'd rather get this over with. All right. What are the consequences that you're going to suffer for this? Um, I don't know, because I don't think, well, I don't think she knew that he was a werewolf. I can only hope for a stern talking down again. She shrugs trying to force a smile. If it helps, you're not the only one who lives in a cage in this life. And I will be here for conversation, if you would like. With all due respect, you've said enough. Understood. So would this be the point that Lee would be phoning with the burner phone? Yeah. Your phone, and there's just about an reception out here and the phone clicks almost immediately hello this is louis davis speaking and i'm guessing you managed to find the poor girl hi mr davis yes um we'll be on route shortly groovy i'll go and tell marion of the news straight away good job and the phone disconnects lee just takes the phone and snaps it in half Pops that in his bag. So we're not going to mention that he was Absolutely a werewolf, right? Not. Best not to. Cool. Just want to get on the... Shh. Yes? Our secret, that is. Ah, okay. So the, the once you all reconvene, you're all wanting to get out of the forest? Yes. Uh, Eyes of the Beast leading them out. <laughs> sure. I, I assumed they were still up, but awesome. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, I won't make you roll again for the uh, wits and survival, probably because you're probably wondering about the trail that you made. Um, it takes some time uh, to return back to Shadow World. The festivities, I guess, are all over. The As you return to the entrance of the uh, club, uh, the music's beginning to die down. People beginning to stand up, you know, get their way out. Uh, you are escorted by one of the bodyguards to the side door. You're ushered through the backstage and Louis Davis is standing by uh, Marion's changing rooms. And Glad to see you again, Miss Ella, and you're welcome back. She just glares at him and doesn't say anything. Fab. And he just, like, pushes open the door. I assume you will enter with Ella? Yes. You will enter, and Marion, who was sitting down, looking at the mirror, sees you enter, the four of you enter, and she stands and she turns. And almost a warm smile illuminates her face. Ella, thy, my darling, are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm sorry. I guess I just have lots to learn. It is quite all right, Ella. I know. We've all been there. She ex opens her arm. Would you like a hug? She closes her eyes and she goes through the motions of taking a breath. Yes, she says with a smile and the two sort of interlock with a hug. 
you also notice that whilst they're hugging, it seems genuine enough. Ella, with blinding speed, like a blink and you miss it sort of moment, drives a knife from behind Marion's back and drives it through where the heart should be. You see the blade poking out where the heart should be, and Marion is just in total shock and awe. That's the last time you'll ever fuck with me. Oh, fuck. Louis just pokes his head round the door. Sweet, sees it as you turn to him. Do not say a word of this to anyone. If you were to look at Louis, his eyes all cloud over. He looks blank. And with a very normal sounding voice, rather than this whole charade thing, he just goes, No, I, mm, I won't say this to anyone. And she looks between the four of you. That goes for you as well. This was Anarch. Understand? There's like a sadistic smile on Hendrick's face. Like, he kind of enjoyed what he just watched a little bit. <laughs> Fuck yeah, sister. Stick it to the authority. My lips are sealed. Good. I don't know what she promised you, but... You'll have it. And I'm able to pull in some favours and give you a little extra as well. She sort of rubs her nose. There's some more tears coming down her eye. You fall best leave. Got a lot of cleaning to do. By the way, if you want to mm, finish the job with her, I won't say anything either. What do you mean? You'd always gain her power. No. I'll do it my way. Hey, Liliana, what just happened? Thank you for tuning in to this actual play. We at Lord by Night Productions hope you enjoyed yourselves as much as we did playing and recording it. You have listened to Pride Podcast by Night, a queer as fuck vampire the masquerade one shot using 5th edition rules. Our stunning cast for this episode were Sarah as Liliana Kowalski of Clan Larmier, Ethan as Hendrix of Clan Zanitsi, RJ as Norman Lee of Clan Gangrel, Vin Fox as Miracolo of Clan Toreador, and to the Law by Night podcast guy as your storyteller and NPCs. You can support our beautiful cast by following them on their various social media platforms. Sarah can be found at The Hype Goblin on Twitter and TikTok. Ethan can be found at Dark Lord by Night, all one word, on Twitter. RJ can be found at RJJustice282 on Twitter and Twitch. And Vin Fox can be found at VinFoxVA on Twitter. And to be kept updated on all things Law by Night, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.